Artwise. Welcome to Artwise today with Taylor J Tyler Jacobson. Sorry about that. Uh, he's our special guest and his work is featured in our current special exhibition, Enchanted, a History of Fantasy Illustration from the Norman Rockwell Museum. Uh, I wanna thank our exhibition sponsor, Sea Rock City. And I wanna thank our Artwise sponsor who sponsors the series of lectures every year, Martha Mackey. We couldn't do this without their gifts. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Tyler. He graduated from the Academy of Art University in San Francisco with a Master of Fine Arts in Illustration. After graduation, he began working for Wizards of the Coast, which happens to be the parent company for Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering. Now, although he is very recognized for his work in the role playing in fantasy realm, Tyler is a renowned painter and is a master of composition, color, and action. And he has worked not only for D&D and Magic, but for Simon & Schuster, Rolling Stone, Entertainment Weekly, the New Yorker and several other publications. He's also done work for Bollywood movies, which I'm excited to see all that he has to offer. We have three works by him in the exhibition, including an Egyptian themed mummies mask piece, Wat Watley, the warrior poet, which is a favorite of his, a character card that he helped design, and the ever popular signature image, the flying red dragon for Dungeons and Dragons, which you can see behind me that we all love. Um, so we are so excited that you're here, Tyler, and he will take questions at the end or as we go, kind of, if something pops up. So please put them in the comments or chat. Tyler, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, that was a wonderful intro. It was very, very nice. I'm honored. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, well, well, I guess we can just uh, jump into it here. Um, so as, as we've gone over, I'm, I'm Tyler Jacobson. Um, I'm an illustrator. I'm a concept artist. I'm a painter. Um, I just, I do a whole bunch of things, but I'd say primarily I'm an illustrator. And what I'd like to do now, or what I plan to do, I guess, for the next hour is I'm going to show you folks some slides and we'll kind of go through like a little history of um, my career as, you know, from where I started to because where I am now. And then I think more, the most important part will be that I'd love to, you know, chat with folks um, if you can post questions and um, we can have a little, as I finish the slides up, we can have a little Q and A and, and discuss, um, you know, everything about the industry and techniques or whatever you want to throw out. Let's, um, let's go for it. So um, I guess to, yeah, get started, I will, I will share my screen here and we, we, we can look at a bunch of pieces of art that are, um, I'll start off with pieces that sort of inspired me and then we'll get into my portfolio stuff. So. Here we go. And I, just before I jump into that, I do want to say um, again, thank you for having me. And I, I really wish I could have been at the museum in person, but um, you know, with all the cool digital tools we have today, we can we can substitute this way. So thank you so much. All right, here we go. This will be where we started. So this is where I started. Um, I think I was probably about four years old when this piece was created um so as you can see i was i was into dinosaurs but uh, maybe i'm um, also a little bit into as we get into fantasy um but, uh, you know many years maybe a decade later when i was in high school i did um i did uh let's see oh, whoops i did this piece um so this is actually when i'd started getting into um fantasy work. Uh, this is actually inspired by an artist that I love that I believe is in the show as well, Tony Dieterlitzi. And um, he inspired me as a kid to um, to really get into, you know, he'd done so many pieces in D&D &D work that um, this really just got me into um, fantasy as a, as a genre. But let's, um, as I grew up, let's talk a little bit about the people that inspired me to become an artist. Um, so this is actually an artist uh, named uh, Greg Manches. I also believe he has some pieces in the show as well. He was a huge influence for me when I was in art school. But, but why I bring this piece up is um, something that became really important to me as I grew as an artist is action or motion in pieces. And I, and I always gravitated towards Greg's work because there was always so much suggested motion in his pieces. There's always this feeling of people moving and um, it, it just became a cornerstone for how I wanted to tell stories and show action. But um, going a little further back in time, um, <laughs> forgive the pun, th this is 
this is actually where I think my beginning of my inspiration started in the, in the, when I was a young kid in the eighties, I was really into um, eighties films that are, you know, super nostalgic these days, but there was mostly, I love the movies, but I really loved all the art that came along with the movies. And there, there's a lot of that today and it's, it's okay, but it's, a, it's mostly, you know, photo photographs being put together, but I really love the actual painting, the artifacts, the paintings that were made in the 1980s, especially work by this artist here, which is Drew Struson, one of my favorite artists of all time. He, um, and he did all those painted movie posters in the 80s um, and, and into the 90s. And he started early in the 70s as well. But this is you know, one of his most famous posters, the Indiana Jones Temple of Doom poster. These kinds of things really, it, I know my work, when you see, when we get to my um, slides of my portfolio, you're gonna see my work isn't actually like this, but it's this idea of, oh, I can create stories through art that was early on in my inspiration to become an artist. Um, here's a movie poster that was, um, forgive these small ones, but I, I was keeping the, the other artist stuff small because I'll have my work much bigger. But this is a movie poster that I really love by an artist named Thomas Blackshear, who's also in this um, fantasy show, I believe. Um, the Enchanted Show. Uh, this is a, a great movie from the 80s um, by Ridley Scott and Legend. Uh, but Black, Thomas Blackshear did this phenomenal piece um, with the big bad guy. And it's just a great painting. And it always, always inspired me when I was younger. This is another piece by Thomas. Um, just this beautiful King Kong piece. But there's more, there's, there's action and storytelling in here, which is all, all things that really got me um, inspired when I was a young kid. Um, and then, the, then we start to get more heavily into the fantasy stuff. So I, I really got inspired by fantasy um, illustration that I grew up with. And one of the premier artists that, that really hooked me, I'd say, and, and I'd said, I would say pushed me down the, the avenue to become a fantasy illustrator, which is prim primarily the work that I do, um, is this artist named Angus McBride. Um, he's a British artist, and he did a whole series of historical illustration books, but he did a series of paintings for the Lord of the Rings, which is one of my favorite fantasy stories. And his work for it really, really just drove home the, the fact that I want, this is the space and the genre that I really want to tell stories in. So these are some of Angus McBride's pieces that he did for the Lord of the Rings in the eighties. And then um, there's also you know, the legendary um, John Howe who did a ton of Lord of the Rings pieces as well as Alan Lee who did this piece here of um of the Golden Hall and Edoras for the Lord of the Rings. So these are these are a lot of people that were my inspirations and they kind of pushed me down the road to become an illustrator. And um, just to give you a little backstory on that, I, I as a kid, I did a lot of drawing, um, but I didn't go initially go to school for art. I, I went to school for um, biology. I was gonna become a scientist. I have some scientists in my family that I looked up to um, their biologists, my aunt and uncle, and I wanted to follow in those footsteps. But I would say pretty quickly, I, I kind of fell out of that and was not, not too interested in the um, sort of research science and all the data and numbers that you had to do. So I, I, I got basically sort of like a loose tour of um, art at the school I was going to at the time. Um, did a lot of like printmaking and ceramics and drawing and painting, but it was nothing was super focused. So I wanted to, at that time, make a career out of it. So I looked at uh, various art schools all across the country and I found one that I really liked. And it was in my somewhat hometown. It was um, in San Francisco. I went to the Academy of Art University and I went there for illustration. And uh, pretty quickly, I'd say within a month, I feel like I learned more about creating art and the techniques of creating art than I had previously learned in my entire life. So it was a, it was a crash course. And I was there for three and a half years and I, um, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was really an incredible experience learning from most of the teachers who were professionals in the industry. So that, that, let's move into that. So this is some of the work that I created in that program at the Academy of Art. I really was focused on storytelling, not necessarily strictly focused on fantasy. I was actually doing stuff from literature. This is from Moby Dick. Um, I did a, a series of paintings basically on tragic characters in literature, but these are the, the Moby Dick, the Captain Ahab pieces that I created in that program. 
and it, these these sort of because I wasn't doing like really specific fantasy stuff, I was I was getting inspired by artists that did a lot of sort of adjacent fantasy or early fantasy work, you know, um, you know, people like Howard Pyle and N.C. Wyeth. But I I kept going and I, I I started to enjoy artists like Frank Frazetta and I wanted to push the envelope on how I can do more fantasy. So this is sort of probably like my first big fantasy piece and it's from a, a Norse um, legend, you know, the, the story of Beowulf. But the, you know, the fantasy aspect is he's sort of fighting this big monster, which I kind of framed as more like a bear, but also a monster. So this is like an early attempt for me to get into the fantasy realm. This is more more stuff for that. But the, um, not, only, not only am I messing around with sort of fantasy themes, I'm also starting to play with um, composition here, which is is really something I focus on now in my my professional work. But you know, in school, you can have you can kind of mess around a little bit. You can fail at stuff. You can experiment. And so this is all me trying to figure out how I want to make my images look. Like, what's the look for me? Um, so this piece right here is actually not a piece from school. We're we're out of we're out of school now. I'm I'm done with school. I've I'm in the industry now. And this is actually the first job I got for a company called Wizards of the Coast, but for a brand called Dungeons and Dragons, which is a game that I grew up playing. So it was a it was a big deal for me to, to get this job pretty soon after school, after getting out of school, to get to work on this brand that I that, that really inspired me as a kid to to be interested in fantasy. Um, this is one of those tough pieces for me because I, I can't look at it uh, and be um, too happy with how it turned out. But I like to really show people this is, this is where I started as a professional. Um, and I work for, I, I still work for D&D &D to this day. So this was uh, going on 12, 13 years ago that I started working for these, this company. And I did a number of pieces for D&D. &D. Uh, these are all cover pieces. This is a cover and this is um, another cover piece that I did for them. So th th this is kind of where I took off, I'd say, for my career. I started doing so much work for this company that um, I, I got to basically graduate with them up to the core book covers, which are the most iconic um, d d pieces. They're, they're these large books that they put out every few years that have all the rules to the game. So I was really honored when they asked me to do the, the cover for a couple of those core books. These are two of those, those covers here. Um, but, uh, but as we talked about with some of like Greg Manchez's work when I was in school or when I was younger that inspired me, this is the, the energy that he had in his work are, are things that inspired me to sort of create really dramatic pieces that have lots of motion in them. Um, so, and the reason I bring that up is it's, um, you know, as if any folks have gone to the, the gallery there at the Hunter Museum and seen the, the pieces that are all around, all of those artists were inspired by other artists in the industry, as well as I was inspired by many of them. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really nice way to see how many artists sort of build on top of each other. Um, you know, I, I'd spoken about Drew Struessen earlier and how he was, you know, inspired by people like Alphonse Mucha and, and, and just right before him by an artist named Richard Amsel and that, that we're all working together in the industry and inspiring one another. And, and we all kind of build off of each other's experience and, and styles. Um, so after I did a lot of D and D work, um, they're in the same, at Wizards of the Coast, they're in the, they're in the same floor with another company called Magic the Gathering. And those folks ended up seeing the work I was doing for D and D and they asked me to come over and do some work for Magic the Gathering, which is a fantasy brand, you know, it's a fantasy brand as well, but it's a bit different from D&D &D in that it's a lot more energetic and um, I, I tend to equate it to, you know, it's like the X-Men, whereas D&D uh, &D is more like the Lord of the Rings. So there's a lot more um, excitement, I guess, and punchiness and the, lots of explosions and um, magic going all over the place for the Magic the Gathering game. And so I started doing a lot of work for them. And this is a bunch of pieces that I did for Magic the Gathering over the years. Uh, so these were actually some early ones for me, but um, I wanna give the, the sort of um, Wizards of the Coast part of my career a little sidebar for the moment, because I'd like to chat about 
um, as the as it was said in my little introduction there. Um, I have also done a lot of work that isn't fantasy, and I have a few. I've picked a few slides that I think are are, are pretty good examples. I wish um, they mentioned the Bollywood piece that I had done. I wish I had that in here, um, but you can find it on my website if you go check it out. But um, yeah, I, um, I'll show you a few here. This is a piece I did for um, Scientific American. And again, I'm trying, I really want to get some motion and energy into this, even though the figures are kind of standing still, but I'm adding wind and all those kinds of things. This is for a double page spread article on um, early um, humans coming over to North America roughly 13, 15,000 years ago. Um, this is sometimes I've done pieces for um, entertainment. So television, this is, a, this is a fun one for a show on um, Adult Swim. And it was, I had just a blast doing all these, I had to do all these portraits of all these actors. And it, that kind of brought me back to that um, Drew Struessen movie poster stuff that really inspired me when I was younger. So this is a, such a fun job. And a, a rare thing that is, I, they had me paint the lettering, which is not something that people ask. It's usually done by graphic designers, but I got the opportunity to paint the lettering in, which was pretty fun. This is a Western piece I did for Penguin. I really wanted to push the the motion in this one, you know, with this coat going, um, kind of flapping around and the the fire blowing through the air. That this this whole piece was all about me sort of capturing that like split second frame and that cinematic frame in time, which is something I really like to do in my work. Here's another one, very similar to that, trying to catch that that cinematic moment. This is for a um, book called The Scoundrel, which was a um, I believe a self-published book. It's a really, really fun one to work on. This is another piece I did for Scientific American that was about Vikings in Greenland. So the, to, the reason I put a lot of these in here is that I think it's really cool to see the, the variety of different work that's required for illustration. It's not just, you know, I do a lot of fantasy work, but sometimes, you know, we need to depict historical moments like you saw with the, the early um, Scientific American piece that I showed. Um, this one is talking you know about um about history in greenland so there's a lot of things that go into those kinds of jobs where you need to basically work with the researchers and the scientists that wrote the articles to make sure you get the details right so i had to get the clothing accurate to how the norse people lived at the time i had to get the spearheads all correct i'd actually for this particular job i had actually painted all the dogs a certain way they all kind of looked like huskies and then the notes I got back were that the breed probably didn't look that way. It probably looked more like what I had to change them to, which is kind of like an English elk hound or wolf hound or something like that. So the, the, sometimes those little things come up and the, they're fun little, little um, adventures basically you have to take in these kinds of jobs. So um, this is actually moving back into stuff that's not... Um, this stuff that's more fantasy, I guess. So this is a piece I did for um, one of the Wheel of Time books for tour books. This is some more game art. So I kind of wanted to just flip through a, a, a bunch of different illustration pieces that I've done. And then the next slide we're gonna talk about here is, a, is visual development work that I do. So I do a lot of visual development work for games where you know we're early on in a product that they're making and we need to explore what the world looks like you know what what kind of clothing do people wear what kind of weapons do they use in this game what kind you know and what's the culture behind these things we, you, you can you can create all kinds of generic weaponry but we really want to we really want it to feel authentic and so that's a lot of the um, visual development work that i do here's a, an example of that you know of, of making sure we explore the costuming and the tattoos of this culture and how they how they construct their decorations and all these kinds of things Here's some pirates that I did for another set. You know, how do, how do we make these pirates different from the pirates people have seen on, in films and in television? These ones are for the card game. And th there's a lot of all kinds of neat little fantasy things I get to do with it. a lot of this visual development where I'm creating new creatures that are, you know, they're demons or they're giants or they're, um, there's there's a lot of anatomy that has to go into it, and th these are kinds of things that I really love to um, play around with because I like I, I do have that science background, and I'm interested in how animals work and 
I like to bring a lot of that anatomy stuff into um, the the concepts that I create for these games. Every once in a while, when I'm doing visual development, we like to create what we're calling like mood plates, and that's a it's basically a really loose illustration of of a particular character or a scene where we want to get the feel of of how it is, but we don't bring it all the way to a final illustration because the point of these is is to show other people that work on the on the game. We want to inspire them in their creative process as well. So this is actually not used in any advertising or print or anything. It was mostly internal. It was for people working on this particular game for D&D, for them to see it and be inspired and write different things about it. Um, so it's, it's interesting how sometimes you'll create an image and it's not used in print or publication, but it's used inside of a company to, um, to get better, more creative uh, products. This is another piece that had similar um, similar uh, intention was to inspire a team of uh, game designers to develop the game in a certain way. So um, then, then we're going. Back. I'm going to go over just a few more cards. Um, you know, I don't want to um, do too many slides here. I'd love to love to answer some questions and chat with folks if they're out there in the chat. But these are some more pieces that I did for Magic. And these are some of my favorite ones, which is why I've included them here near the end. They're ones that I sort of consider milestones, like they allowed me to, or they, they were breakthroughs. I, I, for some reason, had a particular realization while working on these or um, in the development of them. I tried to solve a much harder problem that I'd never solved before. And they beca they've become sort of milestones in my, um, they're big standouts, I guess is a better way of putting them in my portfolio. Because they represent a, a really a particular time where I had a, a big challenge that I, I feel like I overcame and made something that I really like. And so often you'll find artists that are not happy with, um, I mean, at least for me, I'm I've, there's, I'm not happy with a number of pieces in my portfolio, but every once in a while I'll have these ones that are really wonderful that drive me to, to push myself even harder. And, and these are all ones that I'm showing you now. This is one of my favorite ones that I, I received a, a Spectrum Gold Award for. Um, this was one of those pieces where I, I was stumbling and the art director kind of gave me a little push in the right direction. And I, I really enjoy those collaborations where an art director can give me uh, their perspective and I can push the piece to be better. Um, but this, this is a great example of sort of encapsulating the, uh, my love of fantasy, um, my, my intention to have a lot more motion and energy and action in a piece. And yeah, this one I really love quite a bit. Um, yeah, these are some more pieces actually for D&D, &D, which became some of my favorites that, you know, storytelling is really important to me. So let me go back one slide here. Storytelling is really important to me in illustration. And, you know, I, I'm always trying to focus on maybe three things that actually came up um, in my intro there. That, but the, I really want to have a strong composition so that, you know, my intention is always, if you can see the composition from across the room and it looks interesting, that's that's perfect step number one that will bring people in to see it closer um this is great to have on a book cover like that so that people can see it from all the way across the room and then come over to check out the book but then there's also aspects of the composition where i want flow i want to guide the eye through so as in this particular piece you can kind of see there are, there are blades and weapons sort of pointing you towards the main view or the, the main triangle in the middle of a, of characters but then the, on top of that, I want to have energy in there. So there's a lot of movement and energy. Like I wanted to get the feeling that these bad guys are kind of coming in. They're kind of looming in over the characters that are that are ready to to fight them. And then there's a storytelling aspect. So the the I guess the la the last layer is if you look at this piece long enough, you start to see little bits of storytelling. Like these adventuring crew works together, and there's they all have different backgrounds. It seems or they have their armor is 
is you know weathered in such a way that there's a story suggests a story to be told about where they've been where they're going um you know maybe there's a campfire in the background like they were just about to make camp these are all little aspects that i like to bring in like in this next image i i wanted the feeling of you know these giants have curiosity or this main giant is curious about this character so he's leaning in like you would when you're interested to to hear more but he's also there's a giant behind him that wants to you know basically eat this little guy but he's kind of telling him to wait like he wants to hear more so I, I'm, I'm trying to build those little bits of storytelling into it but by also maintaining the the main impact of the image you know when you see it you're like oh that there's an impact, immediate impact. But then there's, if I keep looking at it more, I'm gonna start seeing lots of little things in there that, that add to the story and tell more story. So um, let me see where I am here. So um, at the end here, I'd love to just do a little quick, like go over just some quick process. I've recently been doing a lot more oil paintings. Most of my career has been digital, um, but this is a piece I did a couple of years ago in, in oil. And I wanted to just do a quick chat about um, process and then I'll put up some sort of time-lapse videos so you folks who are watching can see a bunch of those, um, just kind of how I paint in oils. And then we can jump into um, some questions. So that'd be really great. Um, usually with a piece like this, I start with a basically rough black and white sketch that I'll tend to do digitally. And that, that allows me, um, I really like to do I mean, most of my work of my career has been digital, like I said, but the 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 digital tools are really great for all kinds of um, quick iteration and changing. And you can really mess around with a composition really quick with digital tools and get a lot of color in too as well. There's, there's um, it's super forgiving when it comes to that and really flexible and can be really high speed if you need it to be. So usually I'll have these two, I'll have a black and white one where I kind of have my values more established and solved. And um, it allows me to kind of figure out how the composition can be and how it can read from far away. And then I'll start to get in the color um, that I wanna work with. And um, what I'll do after this slide here is, um, let me just change the screens here and I'll begin a little time-lapse of some some stuff I can chat about it just a little bit as we as they play out. Um, but then I think it'd be great if we jump into the questions. So here we go. Here's um, a, some a little time lapse of how I went through the process of painting this painting on board here. I um, I tend to um, Are we still in here? I think I did. We did we crash at all? Are we still there? Okay. So um, um, I'll just let these um, little time lapses go of me doing some paintings, and I think it'd be great if we um, jumped into some questions now. Well, Tyler, one of our questions is actually about process, and since you were okay. showing, could you uh, talk us through a little bit about? when you get um, a job versus when you might be working for yourself and what your research is and how you get from beginning to end since? Yeah, totally. Uh, that's a great question. Um, th these, I think every artist has like a different approach to this kind of thing. And mine can sometimes be a little wild. I, um, I often talk about how my, I never paint a painting the same way each time. But there are a bunch of things that are basically like the order of operations. So yeah, I'll usually get a prompt from an, an art, um, a company that requires the art. And in that prompt is usually gonna be like a description of the piece that they wanna see, as well as some dimensions and it's the, some sort of branded IP stuff that needs to be in there. You know, if it's for like D&D or Magic the Gathering, there's very specific things to their brand that needs to be present. And um, they'll send me reference of that kind of stuff. And so the way I usually start is I, I try and start really small with little tiny thumbnail drawings. And I, I do a few of them, but my goal with those is to actually get the most impactful read on the composition. So I tend to start with like three values, you know, like a dark value, a light value, and a middle value. And I'll just paint little, little tiny paintings with just those values so that I can... Um, 
really solve it from that um, impact level of if it can read at that really tiny space, it's going to be quality like the the compositions are going to have enough hook to pull the viewer in at that size. Um, and once I figure that out, then I move into a tighter sketch where I get all the details that the client needs, you know, what the character looks like, what their armor looks like. I start to push that stuff in there. And then I'll do a, a basically a rough color sketch that that shows them the the my intention for where I want to bring the colors in the final image. And most of the time, the the cycle for that is going to be that the art director will look at those sketches and they'll either have feedback on things that need to be adjusted or they'll say, go for it. And um, then I'll move into the final piece. And then at that point, that's when I really get into the research. Um, so I'll, I'll collect a whole bunch of um, anatomy stuff. If there are monsters in there, I'll start doing some design on, on designing the anatomy of the monsters. Um, and then that, that I have giant folders full of all kinds of animals and inspiration of other art that was really interesting to me. So I start to dig into that stuff and I usually have a, you know, on my screen I'm working um, and I have a big second screen that's just completely full of images of what the, the stuff that I wanna be thinking about while I'm working on this, um, on tightening up the drawing. So then I'll do a really tight drawing of that, of that loose sketch that I did that has all those things solved. And that's where I can start to really paint. And I, I use those, those earlier sketches as my reference on how to progress forward and keep that same impact that I had at the really small thumbnail and color sketch. I'll have those right next to me while I paint the big one. So I can keep that same level of impact while I get into all that little bit of fidelity. So I'd say that's kind of like a breakdown of how I, how I work through the process, but great question. Thank you. So what is the, the difference for you between doing this digitally and doing it now that you're painting oils more and what you're demonstrating in your videos um, is, and does a particular client prefer one over the other or does it matter? You know, it goes, I'd say it goes, some clients do prefer you know, they don't, I rarely run into a client that sort of outwardly says they prefer a particular medium, but sometimes the, the job itself sort of dictates what needs to be done. So, you know, I might be doing a piece for a company that needs the image to be on layers, um, which would mean that they have a whole bunch of different layers in Photoshop that they can move things around if they need to. So in that situation, it kind of, it kind of has to be digitally done. Mm -hmm. um, but, but most of the, clients I've worked with, they don't really care. They're, they're more after the artist's look as opposed to how they made the paintings. But the, you know, the big thing for me is as I've been doing a lot more oils, it's, it's, you know, just the nature of the medium makes it look a lot different from the digital pieces that I do. So there's, there's also that risk of you, you don't want to blindside the, um, the client by sending them something that they're not ready to see, you know, they're, they're expecting all this digital work and all of a sudden they get um, they get a oil painting that they're not used to. So usually in that case, I I let the um, art director know like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna do an oil piece on this one. I know I've done a lot of digital stuff, but I you know want you to see that, or I just want you to, to you know manage your expectations that you're gonna get an oil painting out of me in this one. And usually they're receptive to that, and I try and keep the quality the same as well. But you know the the major differences for me are just sort of there's a lot more. I'm used to the forgiveness and flexibility and speed of digital. So mm -hmm. I lean on those tools early on when I'm gonna do an oil painting now. And I, I try, I basically make the painting as close to finish as I can digitally. And it allows me to shift over into the oil process a lot more comfortably. But I'd, I'd say that, yeah, the, those are the biggest differences is that the, the digital side is still something I'm a lot more comfortable with. It's a lot more forgiving and oils, um, I still love them. Just the last time I did really big oil illustrations was about 10, 10 years ago. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm getting back into it now and it's been a really fun process. You don't forget, right? It's like riding. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. It is, it is basically like riding a bike, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, I guess, little hurdles I have to remember to, to, to manage as I move forward with, with more oil paintings and my illustration work. So when you're um, designing a piece, um, you talked about the anatomical research for um, 
for humans or animals or whatever creatures you're creating. But when you're doing, for example, for a role playing game, do they tell you the background? Do you need to know how to play the game? Um, do they tell you the specs of the character, that kind of thing? You know, for for game stuff, they tend to give you basically like a, a little synopsis on the background, mm -hmm. but they're not they're not really like hugely concerned with you knowing much about the game. Okay. Um, in fact, it's actually a, more of a distraction than anything. Cause then, you know, just as an example, like say if they gave you a bunch of the rules, but then they want you to paint a certain painting, oftentimes whatever you tell an artist that you're going to see. So it becomes this extra level of distraction. If I'm, I'm worried about all this rule and game mechanics, as well as an illustration in the story I'm trying to tell. You know, the, the, I guess the, the joke we often talk about in the industry is, is that, is that whatever you tell the artist, whatever you talk about, the artist is going to try to depict. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, like if, if you want to see a character from the front, but then the art description is talking about a symbol that's on his cape on the back of them, the artist is going to go, they're going to bend over backwards to try to figure out how to show the symbol that you talked about on the cape when it's, it doesn't need to be there, right? So a lot of the times uh, art descriptions don't mention the game mechanics at all because it can be a distraction and take away from, from mm -hmm. the final product. Okay. So one of the questions we had in the chat is, when you work on art for a book cover, how much do you think about title treatments and other supporting text? And at what point in your process is this Part of your consideration oh man that that's a great question i wonder if i can bring my slides back up here because sure. that is um that's something i think about quite a bit I, let me move to a piece that's a cover well a lot of these are covers but as as one thing you have to think about it with cover work is there's always a text there's always going to be text and so the rule is i wouldn't even say it's a rule but it's a thing to really really think about is you have to create areas of that are dead space, but that are also that don't have lots of competing values. So, like in this particular image that I have up, the 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 place where I don't have tons of competing values are are like at the bottom, right below the character's little guy with the cape and the book, the red book, right below his feet. There's kind of an area that's mostly mid to dark, and then above him there's like the area of the giant's forehead and the character behind him the values in that area are not hugely competitive so it allows you to place text in those spots the the same with this one there's a lot of space up top above the characters for the text to exist and now these are these are done for D, D books so there's the texts are always in the same spot so i always have to save the top third and a little bit of the bottom for those kinds of texts and that's that's how you see most um, covers for, let me, let me move back through some of my pieces that are, were more cover based. Mm -hmm. Sorry if this, I'm just going to flash a whole bunch of images here as I, as I move through really fast. But so um, here's another one. Now this is a square format, but it was on a cover because the it's for a book series that had like 14, 15 books in it and they wanted uniformity. So, they asked me to do basically almost a square composition because they were going to have a gray space at the bottom or the top. And they were going to put the book cover title there so that all the books in the series had a similar format. Um, so that was nice because in this particular one, I didn't have to worry about saving areas of the image for text, mm -hmm. but in a piece, you know, a piece like this particular one, it wasn't a cover, but it was, um, it required text because it was a double page spread in a magazine. Um, on the left side of the image, you can see this, there's like a little bit of a landscape and clouds that was all saved in order to place text. So we needed to have a big open area in the composition for text to go, as well as right down the, not really down the middle because of the way this is an off center double page, mm -hmm. but down the back side of this walrus, you can see I had to, I had to account for there being a gutter there. So the magazine had a gutter running right down that area. So I didn't want to have too much crucial information to be right there. So these are all little things you have to think about. And that's kind of my favorite thing about illustration is the challenge of, of meeting what's needed imagery wise, as well as what's going to be needed in print. So this one, you know, the, I saved some space up top 
and some space in the bottom for those sections. Same with this one. There's a lot of space up top for the title and, and a little bit of space near the bottom where there's not much interesting information that you can put text. Um, so these are all little, little things you have to keep track of. But if it's for a book cover or magazine or an article, yeah, like th that's one of the biggest things you're gonna need to be remembering as you build your image is those spaces where you need to leave text to be available. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. Um, I kind of went off the rails a little bit, but hopefully that was, um, was good, useful information there. Oh, definitely. Uh, Tyler, can you reshare your screen? Maybe go out of it and reshare a couple of people oh, yeah. who's um, seeing your screen properly. Oh, no problem. Um, let's see. How's that? Hopefully that's better. Hopefully it's fine. <laughs> As, since I could see it the whole time, I wasn't sure. Okay, uh, cool. We have a couple more process related questions. Um, Great. Um, what are your best tips for digital art? Um, pe people are saying that sometimes they feel rather clumsy with it. And also, how are you, how did you, I think you started before social media was really a thing um, as, a, as in your career, but how did yeah. you get the attention of so many clients? Um, so I, well, let me, let's, let me, I think I could probably I'll answer the the social media one first because it's probably getting pretty quick. But then the 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 one about um digital process will probably be a little more long winded. But um, I when it comes to like social media, well, when it comes to getting clients, I tend when I got out of the school when I got out of school, it was basically like, hey, um, the way you get clients is you got to go to the, either the publishers' offices in New York or you got to email them or you got to call them or you got to send them samples or portfolio um, samples or you got to um, find them at conventions and that's typically how we we did it back then um, i i actually was in a great situation where people saw some of my work at my when i was at school they saw my stuff in the gallery um, particularly um, irene gallo um, at tour books she saw my work at a school art show and she kind of passed my name along to D and D was where I got that kind of stuff. But the best way to get seen in that respect is to really, is to, I would say, if you can, to go to conventions where there are going to be art directors in the industry that you're interested in mm -hmm. and get your, get face time with them. That's really valuable for them to put a face to an artist. But the, the other way is, is, yeah, social media is so big these days. So, so make sure that you, um, you don't have to really get into social media because it can be, you know, it, it can be unhealthy at times. Like social media can be pretty unhealthy. So, but it's, it's good to have at least a presence. You know, I have, I have social media, but I, I'm not on there for personal reasons. I'm on there for professional reasons. So I post on those things when it comes to the art that I've created, things that are new that I've done. Um, I, I keep it as a sort of like a news board for the work that I'm working on. And that's a great way to stay present in the minds of art directors because they're all on, most of the art directors I know are on social media for that specific reason, for discovering new artists. So it's a great place to advertise your work. It's, um, the landscape has changed so dramatically since I was in school. You know, we, physical portfolios were all we were trained on. And now it's, you know, your work exists digitally. You don't really need representation. You don't really need physical portfolios. If you have a website, you almost don't even need that. It's like, do you have a good social media presence? So that's definitely the, the arena to focus on out there. Folks that are still trying to build their portfolios, you know, get, definitely try to get your work in front of art directors in the social media space, because that'll be important. It's just be careful about messaging them directly and things like that because they're they're pretty busy folks and it's hard to get to the, it's hard to really get their attention in that in that way and it can be you know sometimes it can be too much but you know if you get the opportunity to meet art directors at at um conventions and get your portfolios in front of them definitely have something you know whether it's an ipad whether it's an actual book bring those things with you because that that's going to be uh, you know, people always talk about right place at the right time, but it's it's like be at the right place at the right time and prepared to show people your work. Um, so uh, to address the other question, though, about digital work, I believe they were asking about how 
how to really get into it. Is that, was that right? If what are your best tips for digital art? I've been st steadily improving my work over the years, but I still feel rather clumsy with it. And I understand, I mean, you've had years of experience working with different programs. I'm sure that's part of it. So. Yeah, yeah, that was a great, really great question. So I, I would honestly say this is, um, and it may seem like, like almost like a step back for people that are trying to, that are really entrenched in digital work is to try out traditional mediums so mm -hmm. try out watercolors try out acrylics try out oil painting you know learn how to mix paint really get your get you know for lack of a better <laughs> get your hands dirty for lack of a better term there because um, that's going to help build into digital so much better um, if you're just starting with digital and you have no foundation in traditional stuff it can be a lot more challenging because all the digital tools we use are either not, we're not meant to be painting tools like Photoshop's a great example. I do most of, almost all my work in Photoshop, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a photo editing program. It's never really been a painting program. So what ends up happening is if you have a foundation in traditional mediums, you can start looking for the tools that do an approximation of what you're after. And that's how I started was I, I trained specifically in oils. All the work I did in school is oil painting. And so when I got into digital, I really focused on finding the tool in Photoshop, or I use some another program called Corel Painter for a little bit, finding the tool in those programs that can do somewhat of what I'm after. So if I, if I was doing an oil painting and I wanted to do a glaze, which is a thin coat of paint that you put over and that, that reveals, you know, shows some of the paint that's below it, it's transparent. Um, and it darkens things. So what, what's the tool in Photoshop that does that? And so there's multiply layers and overlay layers that I can fool around with to get a similar effect and so on and so forth. And those things like what, where, you know, what's, how can I get something that's kind of like wet and wet paint? What's the tool that's going to do that in Photoshop for me? Um, that, you know, that term we use in painting is a la prima. So what's the a la prima version or the a la prima tool in Photoshop that I can use? Um, and so it's finding all those little things. Um, mixing paint is actually pretty challenging and there's some other plugins you can find to help with Photoshop on that. But I've always found the best way for me to advance in digitally is to go back to those fundamental basics of traditional medium. That helps me pretty big. But um, if that's not, you know, if you don't wanna go all the way back to that, um, definitely check out, there's a lot of resources online for people doing tutorials. You know, there's not one right way to paint digitally. There's so many other artists out there that have such different techniques than I do when it comes to digital painting that I, I love to go check out their stuff and see what they're doing. Cause maybe I'm going to find some cool little technique that's going to, um, or just some use of the tools in, in, in the digital space that are going to help me sort of change my own process or, or make things more streamlined. You know, as an illustrator, you're always working under a deadline of, and the more, ways you can find to speed up your process or make things less cumbersome or just smoother all, all together, the better off you're going to be. So I'm um, definitely dig into all those resources. But if, you know, just to reiterate to, if you really want to build that um, better painting abilities, I would say, try, try out a bunch of um, traditional mediums, you know, nothing, understanding how paint mixes is a huge thing for helping your digital work, you know, just because understanding color can go such a long way when it comes to digital piece and the flexibility and digital tools for applying color is massive compared to traditional. So. Yes. So a strong foundation in the basics, you have to master those first, I guess. Yeah. I, and, it, and you don't necessarily, I would say like have to go, you know, become like a full on acrylic painter or a full on oil painter. But it's really important to understand all of those processes because, right. you know, uh, like digital is digital is a tool in itself, but it's also in a lot of ways just an approximation of traditional techniques. Um, so sort of doubling down on that, like where what's the origin of of the what's going on with these digital tools um, is going to help you a lot farther, I'd say. I think we have time for two more questions. If you're OK, great. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one, this one's, um, you know, when you were showing all your images, um, I felt like I was looking back a little bit at a mix of Howard Pyle sometimes, sometimes Dean Cornwell, 
sometimes uh, Harvey Dunn, you know, sure. all these um, golden age of illustration greats. Is, is that something, are those artists that you have studied and are inspired by? What's it like being in an exhibit with them as part of Enchanted? Um, I mean, that first of all is, is amazing, huge honor. I mean, the, those artists were the cornerstone of my education. And I'm glad you mentioned Dean Cornwell. He's he, I absolutely love Dean Cornwell and Harvey Dunn. Th those two artists are probably some of my favorites. And th they end up, as you can see, I guess, throughout my work, you can kind of see a little bit of that coming in. Like I, I would look at how, how, um, you know, Dean Cornwell will, would apply paint or color in certain areas or how he would frame characters. And I would, I would have those things up as reference while I was working on pieces. So yeah, th those are huge influences for me. And, and something I was talking about earlier was the, the fact that, you know, artists are built on those, on the background of those other artists. You know, we, what is Newton said, who stands on the shoulders of giants, that, that quote, I might be misquoting him massively, but it's that idea that, yeah, we, we can't, you can't be creative and have your own style in a vacuum. You know, style is born out of how you learn how to make marks as well as the artists that influence you and how you were at some point in your career, probably trying to imitate them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to say much beyond the fact that those were massive influences for me and, and always are. I mean, I, my art bookshelf is full of all the artists that are influences and I still go check them out from time to time. If I'm getting stuck on a piece, and, you know, if I want to do a, a night scene, it's like, well, how do I, who did a cool night scene? And, you know, it's almost always Dean Cornwell did a really cool night scene. So let's go check out this night scene that Dean Cornwell did or, or that Howard Pyle or NC White did that, that were really good. And that well, what can I learn from that? What colors did they use? How did they get the impact across? Maybe I can in, in, infuse some of that into the piece that I'm working on. So here's our last question um, from an attendee. Uh, is there anything you're hoping to do in the future as far as dream projects or ideas that you wanna to bring to life? Oh man, great question. There, there's probably so many that it, it becomes like a hindrance for me to focus on the, on the actual jobs that I'm working on. But um, yeah, there, there's a bunch. There's, I'm, I'm such a big fan of, of movies. Um, it's something that comes up a lot. I'm a real big like film nut. Um, and I, there's, it's not that I necessarily want to make a movie, but I think there's some aspects of like cinematography that I really respect and love researching. There's some aspects of like, of framing a piece that I want to bring more into my work. So I'd love to maybe do a, a series of paintings that are all in a, you know, 70 millimeter Panavision aspect ratio, which is a really, really thin aspect ratio from, um, from I, I, I believe the 70 millimeter stuff first came out in the, probably in the sixties, but, but um, I, or, or there's that long letterbox 16 by nine aspect ratio of film. I want to play with those more because most of the time I'm either working with very horizontal um, not super thin, but, you know, like horizontal square type compositions for things like magic or, or very vertical things like book covers. And those are all great for paintings, but I, I really want to mess around more with that, that real cinematic aspect ratio. So that might be something I do down the line. And um, um, I'd say recently I have been looking more into um, more sequential storytelling so a lot more um, comics and graphic novels, which seem pretty interesting to me. And it's it's a huge challenge that I would be interested in tackling. And so I might try to look into that a little more and see if it's possible to put like a painted comic together. But I um, I did recently put out an art book and I did that with um, Flesk Publishing. Um, if you folks are interested in checking out sort of a big collection of my work, we did a nice big coffee table square format book and I enjoyed that process so much that I think I want to try and do a little more um, collection publication. So I might start, you know, not not unlike a gallery, I might do some bodies of work that I'll, I'll specifically be making just for a book mm -hmm. format. So, um, and, you know, it's not really a graphic novel, but maybe it's a series of paintings that have some, some connectivity to one another and they tell their own story. Um, so these are all just a bunch of things I've been playing around with. The problem is, you know, it's really hard to find time to do these kinds of things when I'm working on um, the professional projects that I have going. So that, that's always the, the great challenge. How do you find time to do your personal work, um, which I think is really important, but it's also 
I often have a hard time doing it myself because I'm just trying to juggle um, the regular day-to-day -day jobs that I need to pay the bills, which is kind of the story of illustration. Yes, it is. So that leads me to what that was supposed to be the final question, but that led me to another question, which oh, is great. Oh, yeah, please. since you are interested in kind of a comic book, graphic novels, possibly film format, are you also interested in writing stories? Or do you want to just try and illustrate something through the through the images themselves? Uh, it might be that I lean on other sort of nar creatively narrative people. I'm I am not much of a writer when it comes to that. My wife is much of a writer, so I feel like we, it might become a cool collaboration where we work on something together. Um, because I, yeah, I'm I'm I would like I really want to tell the stories visually, but I've. It's never something I've tried to write. I've never tried to be a writer. Maybe maybe it's something to break into, but I, I, I kind of would like, I really enjoy the collaboration of illustration work you know, where I'm working with writers and art directors and we work together to make a piece. Uh, it's always been really something that I enjoy. I, I find when, when I'm like, I gotta, I'm gonna do a personal piece and I don't even know where to start. I'm, I almost get frustrated with that process because it's like, I, I'm so used to collaborating with other creatives. So if I do move forward into something like uh, sequential art or, you know, comics or, or just storytelling in a book format, um, I think I, yeah, I'm going to lean on other creatives that I know are good at it and we'll, we'll, we'll make it a collaboration. I think, I'll, I think I'll be really satisfied with that. Look forward to seeing it. Oh, I, I hope, I hope it's going to be great. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to thank everyone who attended tonight. And I hope if you haven't seen Enchanted, you'll come see it. It's only up for a couple more weeks. It closes on Labor Day. Um, that's our last day for this wonderful exhibition before it travels to another venue. Um, I want to thank the Norman Rockwell Museum for um, it, organizing this wonderful exhibit for uh, to Sea Rock City for sponsoring it and to Martha Mackey for sponsoring this talk. And please do go to Tyler's website. I believe it is tylerjacobson.com. Tylerjacobsonart.com. Tylerjacobsonart.com. And you can look at all of his work, a lot, a lot of his work there in the different galleries and look at the book and um, lots of interest. And his blog, I think, is on there too. Um, so please join us at the museum and online. Thank you so much for uh everything tonight taylor oh well, thank you so much for having me and i'm um, just to add on i guess to that it I mean, my blog is definitely way out of date but it is <laughs> it is linked on there um but you can also uh, you know we talked about social media so you can also find me on um, most of the stuff i post is on instagram and that's at tyler jacobson art and i believe my twitter is jacobson tyler because someone had already taken it um same as my website someone had already taken it so i had to throw art on the end of it but um, uh, yeah, please check me out there. I also do a stream every Wednesday with my friend Raymond Bonilla. We do an art stream where we just chat about the industry, art. Sometimes we just talk about movies, but at the same time we're, we're doing painting. So we'll, we paint and talk and he's a gallery artist. So he's um, usually working on his gallery art and I'm working on just some personal fantasy work pieces that I like to do. And we chat, we basically talk shop. So if you're interested in that, it's called Live Brush. Check it out on Twitch. And uh, we also have a YouTube. Um, you can check out our um, VODs on YouTube. Um, but I, yeah, I, again, I want to thank you so much for having me. I wish I could have been at the gallery in person. Um, it's a really wonderful, fantastic show. Um, when I first saw it at, at the Rockwell Museum, it was amazing. And I know it's just as amazing with you folks out there in Chattanooga. So um, uh, all the folks in the chat, if you haven't been out to, sh to the show, please come check it out. It's, <laughs> it's really wonderful. Some of the, the best artists in the fantasy genre, much less the genre of art in general. Um, some of the greatest artists that ever lived really are there. So please check it out. And thank you again for having me. It's been wonderful. Um, I loved our back and forth with the questions and um, hope to see some of you folks in person. Um, so thank you. Thanks everyone, have a great evening.